welcome everybody to our sixth um, open to all and free to attend open clock club. Uh, great to see some new faces out there. Uh, and Happy New Year, of course, from uh, Yorkshire in England. So, as always, here, our bit of housekeeping first, and that is um, the uh, recording will go on our YouTube channel that's dedicated to uh, Open Clock Club, which is a, a, an archive channel. And we're typically getting kind of 100, uh, 150 or so views, and that's building. So I think what people are doing is they're looking back when they join, and hopefully there's some useful information there. So do remember, so I've got a few people still coming in, so admit those. Um, do remember that if you want to remain anonymous, then keep your uh, camera turned off. So um, this event entirely relies on you guys keeping the live chat going. And of course, our amazing team here uh, back, at, uh, back at base also doing that, Rachel, on the computer. So I think there's a bit of a tradition for you to tell uh, Rachel where you are and um, what you're up to. And uh, so, yeah, welcome to new visitors. Just to remind everybody, this uh, event really started out um, to support readers of our book and it kind of expanded from there. So we're particularly interested in um, new uh, people to the uh, trade or profession or hobby or well-being or why ever you are interested in clocks, we don't mind. Uh, and it's lovely to see you all there. Now, I'm a, we've decided uh, that the first week of every month will be tool week. And um, so we're joined today by a couple of people I know who are sort of professional horologists, maybe more. So again, in the live chat, this isn't about me uh, sort of um, with a three line whip. Really, we'd love to know what your views and alternatives are. Uh, one thing that I'm involved with um, during the week is keeping an eye on the NAWCC forums, or fora, if you will. And that's really cool. I'm learning masses from it because uh, inevitably there are key uh, uh, sort of issues that crop up time and time and time again. So it's quite nice to, um, to discuss that and really link to that this uh, book here, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, Volume 1, is just what it says. It's a beginner's guide to get off the starting line. So wherever possible, we try and keep the number of tools to a minimum. And we've given a couple of re what we feel are reasonable adjustments in terms of shortcuts, as some people might see it, uh, to get their first clock running, which, as you can see here, is a single train Smith's Enfield mantle clock. Now, people have bought the book and they've run through it. And of course they're enthusiastic and straight away, they've been asking about uh, this thing called bushing and depthing. No, they haven't been asking about that at all. They've been asking about bushing, which we are addressing in book two, which will be out in the summer. But there's so much interest in this and so much information and dare I say it, misinformation that, um, that we've decided to actually publish those two chapters as a pre-publication event. And that'll be coming out on Kindle within the next couple of weeks. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in our sort of tool week thing. As always, we'll split this hour into three sessions. So at about quarter past, six GMT, we'll have a break for a couple of minutes, and then we'll have another break uh, a little bit later on. So today we're gonna to be talking about bushing and depthing. And it's one of those um, subjects that really gets people hot under the collar. So, <laughs> so it'll, be, it'll be good fun. Uh, I'll just have a discussion about the two main methods of bushing and depthing, what people call hand bushing and what people call machine bushing and I'll talk about depthing and so on. And hopefully there'll be enough interest in the live chat for us to keep the end of the hour going. But before we get on to that, we just wanna tie up a couple of things from last week. And the first thing is that today, do you remember in our last um, tool week, we gave away the vintage Lindstrom cutter pliers, which I don't know whether they've arrived in California yet, 
um, but uh, they're on their way for sure. And this week we're giving away the uh, this device, which I don't know whether you've seen one before, but it's called, believe it or not, the Tam O'Shanta Horn. And it's uh, a stone that it was mined in Scotland. The, the mine is actually uh, closed now, so you kind of can't buy it anymore. And that's why I'm giving this away, because it, believe it or not, it's actually quite a rare thing. So if you're interested in winning the Tam O'Shanta horn or stone, it's completely free. We'll post it out to you. If you, oh, let's just let Jeremy in. So see you there, Jeremy. Um, if you want to win this, and we'll come back to this later, then in the live chat, please put your name and the Tam O'Shanta stone. And at the end of the hour, we'll draw names out of a hat and then we'll pop it in the post. Now you might be asking, what the heck is the Tam O'Shanta stone or horn as they call it? Well, it's a piece of slate, um, depending on what part of the world you live in. If you live in a, a city uh, that we do, we, we're lucky to live in York. A lot of the roofs here are covered with uh, shingles that are made out of a, uh, a stone called slate. And um, that's what this is. So it's an abrasive stone and it was used by clockmakers and engravers because it's very good at smoothing down brass. So you can imagine if you've done an engraving, for instance, and there are burrs on that engraving, you want to kind of go over it with uh, this stone uh, to smooth down the brass. Now, in the past, he's, he says, putting my, I can't help but always getting on my conservation soapbox, of course. In the, when I, uh, many, many decades ago, when I learned how to do bushing and I'm looking around for my so here they are. And we'll come on to this in a bit, but uh, here's, um, oh, there's a great example, in fact. Here, uh, you can see this is, um, oh, in fact, I won't tell you what it is because you people can tell me what it is in the live chat. So there's a no prize bonus there for telling me what this clock uh, was. Um, so here's a clue. See that square hole there? There's a clue. Um, but look here, there's, you can see that uh, in the plate, there's a little tube of material, which we're going to talk about later. This is a thing called a bush. And in the old days, uh, what I would have done is you put in this piece of material and you can see it's slightly proud from the plate. And then you would have got the Tam O'Shanta stone and actually with a bit of water rubbed away to make the plate and the bush completely smooth. So it was kind of kind of hidden uh, and invisible. Now, personally, I don't do that anymore because when I do bushing, which we'll talk about later, um, you uh, don't you try to minimize damage or change to the material that's surrounding the bush. Now, again, It'd be really cool uh, if you get on the live chat and uh, tell us that that is a lot of rubbish or yes, you try and minimize damage or you don't care or it should be visible. We'd really love to uh, hear your views. Anyway, in the old days, Tam O'Shanta used to be used for smoothing down the brass. Um, so there's your extra bonus. What was this clock? Maybe if I put it the right way up, it'll help you um, a little bit like that. So there we are. Kind of interesting shaped plates, as you can see, the plate is tapered like this. Uh, and it's got, um, yeah, look here. It's quite interesting because on the, um, so I'm going off at a tangent already. On the NAWCC forum, often people come up with clocks that they bought and they don't know what they are or there's bits missing and so on. And this is really important, this kind of forensic um, uh, investigation of a clock. Now I'm getting into a bit of a panic here because I don't actually know what kind of clock this is, but I'll make something up before six o'clock. Um, you can see here, look, you've got holes that go up here. You've got holes that run across here, but you've also got a row of holes up here. Um, and this funny cutout, which I've got an idea what that's for. Um, but anyway, there we go. Quite an interesting 
played. Unfortunately, I don't have the rest of the movement. This is just something I brought on eBay. Um, and you can see, uh, relevant to our bushing discussion, it's got uh, a piece of metal let in here and also some kind of marking as well and a lot of scrubbing of the plate surface. Which tool, thank you? The stone. So the answer, somebody just asked, asked in the live chat, can the tam shanta horn be used for bushing? It can certainly be used for finishing brass, but I would say not on historic work. Um, if you ever have seen or um, worked on marine chronometers, you'll notice that on the back plate of many marine chronometers, or sort of what people call fine regulators, European regulators, maybe American ones too, I don't know. Uh, you'll see this kind of finish. I've just done this very quickly and it's called curling. Uh, sometimes it's only on the edges of the plates and curling is done with a, a Tam o Shanter stone. So, um, so that's, that's one way to use this stone. Nice little bit of research for whoever um, wins it to find out, uh, to do some experimentation with it. But for me, I wouldn't refinish the plate of an historic clock. Um, somebody just asked, is the plate from a carriage clock? Just um, pass a ruler, will you please, Frankie? Oh, I've got my vernier here, this will do my caliper. So you can see that the plate is more than 150 millimeters tall. So the answer is no, it's not from a carriage clock. Um, it's no, it's not from a carriage clock. It's almost certainly an English clock, quite thick plates, probably three, three and a half millimeters. Uh, and of course, I've just thought this up as I've gone along. Uh, I don't really know what it's from, but this is interesting. I'm pretty sure I know what this is about up here. Anyway, we'll come back to that later. So are people asking to win the Tamar Shanta thorn? Yeah. Yes, they are. So good. Keep that, keep that up and we'll draw from the hat later. Another uh, tie up, and we will get round to the bushing and depth thing, don't worry. Another tie up from last week was we happened to mention uh, boxwood. And um, here's what I've just moved to photo on that, that'll be a bit easier. We happened to mention boxwood. And what is it used for? Well, boxwood is a really useful uh, material. In fact, as you get into clock making, as any hobby or profession, one tends to collect everything, of course. You see something at an auction or a mart or an eBay, and you think that is gonna come in handy one day. And boxwood is one of those things. In the old days, um, if you imagine when you uh, clean a clock or a watch in particular, if you use a solvent, say like a mineral spirit to wash the parts in, in order to get that excess uh, material off the components, you would put them after washing into a warm boxwood sawdust, it makes really good sawdust for kind of soaking the solvent away. Today, we don't, well, I, I guess it's still available, but it's probably quite expensive. What we use today is, or what I use today anyway, and again, in the live chat, please, if you've got a view on this, is maize, you know, corn cob, uh, sort of mushed up, uh, which makes a kind of more efficient and less expensive um, uh, uh, alternative to boxwood sawdust. So um, this is a bit of boxwood. It's a slow growing uh, tree. You get it in Europe um, and you often see it in hedges. It was in, in past times, it was used as a ornamental bush and you see it clipped into things like knot gardens and so on. This bit split, but it's very close grained, a bit like fruit wood in some ways it's got quite distinctive bark and if you ever see a boxwood tree being cut down then it's definitely worth getting sections of it because in the uh well we still use it today for making a chuck and this is a, another hobby horse of mine um is that when we talk about uh ah here we are Let's say, for instance, we've got our barrel. This is a barrel, if you're working on the How to Repair Pendulum Clocks Volume 1, this is a barrel out of uh, that clock. Uh, somebody said, is a plate from a Norwich clock. I think you were kind of getting on to the right train there. I'm trying to figure it out as I go along as well. Uh, not, not a bad guess. It's not a weight-driven clock, though, so mm, probably not. 
Um, so if you want to hold this barrel, let's say, for instance, um, this back bearing has worn, which is what we're going to be talking about after the break. Um, and you want to hold this in a chuck, obviously you take the mainspring out and take the barrel arbor out. I've seen people online holding the thing in a three jaw chuck. Now there's no way, to be honest, that you're gonna get that uh, perfectly concentric, really difficult to get it concentric in a three jaw chuck, which is a kind of standard chuck for a lathe. Now you can get expensive Swiss chucks that have got six jaws. Uh, the cost, well, I bought one for my lathe about 10 years ago and it was more than 800 pounds. Um, and even then I would say, if you want to really get this held concentrically, then believe it or not, you hold it in a piece of wood. You basically put your piece of wood, box wood, in the three jaw chuck, tighten it up real tight, machine off the surface, bore a recess in here. I don't know whether anybody's done this. I know we certainly used to do it at the college, which was a good laugh. Um, and uh, the um, and then you can push your barrel into the recess in the wood, and it's held really concentrically. If you want to hold something really concentric, make a boxwood chuck. Uh, people make it out of MDF nowadays, which isn't particularly nice to machine because of the fibers, or you can use plastic. Used all sorts to do that, but a boxwood chuck is a really accurate way of holding something round. Now, somebody said, is the plate from a three train fusey clock? I certainly think it's, it's not from a three train fusey clock per se, but it's a two train fusey clock, I think, with something else. So the question now is, what is that something else that that clock almost certainly had? So boxwood is useful for that. It's also useful for making little uh, rests for um, filing things on. So if you're filing a bit of brass wire, for instance, to make a spring, it, boxwood's really useful for that. And here, look, I've made, um, I don't know where my brass split, oh, here it is. Uh, really useful thing that we talk about in the book is a brass split stake. So if you want to hold components um, to rest on top of here with it being brass, these things are available from the internet, really inexpensive, really useful. Well, I made one uh, from boxwood and you can see it's had a lot of hammer uh, and I drill holes in it as and when I need it. So if you want to hold particularly fine components, again, on the NAWCC site, there was discussion this week about frosted movement. So components that have been acid etched when they've been made. Now that finish is incredibly fragile. So you don't want to kind of I'll hold the thing in the vise or bash it down another bit of brass. So I made this for holding, um, you know, wheels from regulators and things like that, because it's actually kind of really uh, gentle. Is boxwood difficult to get? No, it's not. It's one of those things that with the uh, internet, um, you can actually get the, here's one I bought and never used for turning. So if you go to um, a site for, you know, for wood turning uh, hobbyists and things like that, you can pick up boxwood. It's normally got wax on the ends to stop it uh, splitting. Are the, the questions about the clock are really brilliant, by the way, the, the kind of guesses. Somebody said, is it an alarm? I don't think it is, but you're really on the right track. So keep the, um, keep the, uh, the ideas coming. So this I bought for making a handle for a long case clock winding, winding handle. Uh, and never used it, but it's just really useful to have in stock. So boxwood there. And the last thing before we go for a break, and we honestly, we will talk about depth and bushing when we come back, is a question from Dave L. So hi, Dave, if you're out there. Now, last week we looked at um, pictures of the Harrison clock and Dave asked what was the size of the fly. Now, I couldn't put my hand on the book just immediately then, but I knew I had that information. So when I looked at the clock, I did a drawing, which is here. Uh, it's a sketch, as you can see, but it's got a lot of dimensions on it. So I noticed that the pivot to pivot uh, shoulders is 75 millimeters. So basically between the frame, you know, the, the ab shoulder to shoulder uh, dimension is 75 millimeters. So one day I'll turn all this uh, information into a CAD drawing book. Not at the moment, many, many projects. Um, right, okay. 
the next somebody said is uh the thing for maintaining power or fusey let's just have a little look at it again so to put you out of your misery before we go for our little break um what we've got here are two winding apertures we've got um this is the I think this is the inside of the front plate it is so this is going this is uh striking is that right I'll figure it out after the break um but what we're particularly interested in this item here this square hole is the hole for a fusey stop iron um so when you've got a fusey you have a device for stopping it from being overwhelmed there was another one here and you can see the kind of shadow from a spring you can see the shadow of the foot so this had two trains a going train and a striking train but it had an additional uh device up here which wasn't um an alarm but that's a really good uh, idea so keep the ideas coming and we're gonna have a little break now and we'll start on depth when we get back thank you for the live chat and let's come back in uh, at 24 minutes past so um a couple of minutes something like that see you then Right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to press on now with our um, pushing and depth thing. thing. Um, so, did my printing ever come out? When we've, um, we'll just start with the drawing, maybe that's going to help us, isn't it? So, in our gears for our clock, here we are. These two um, gears engage. You normally have uh, a larger brass wheel meshing with a smaller steel pinion. Uh, this is an intermediate wheel from our clock book clock. And just check there's nobody else uh, waiting to come in. And uh, this is the mainspring barrel. So, uh, these two wheels, if we'll call them wheels, are wheel and opinion, are designed to mesh at a very specific depth here. And if they mesh outside that very specific depth, then the smoothness of transmission of power 
are the efficiency of the, of the transmission of power will be lost. And the worse that depth thing gets, then eventually the clock will either be unreliable or eventually it stops. So if we think about, um, just draw somewhere across here. Yes, they're touching. So that's going that way and that's going that way. So we've got our two, um, we'll call them mobiles. So basically the gears, but let's call them mobiles. So they're rotating. So as this one rotates, it actually makes this one rotate, but it forces this one uh, across there. The action of it uh, engaging actually forces that one across there. And the reaction forces this one, something like in that direction. Now, this is very simplified version of uh, the world because um, this gear here is at the end of that uh, gearbox, which we call a training clock making. Um, so it only has one wheel to engage with, whereas this one is actually part of the train. So there's another wheel here, which is the center wheel. So it's got a relationship with two other wheels. Um, now, when this clock was made, we presume, uh, we don't know, of course, that the manufacturer or the maker um, put those wheels at the, what they felt was the perfect distance. So that distance between the two, let's call it CD, we call center distance. Um, there we go, center distance like that. Now, over time, because of this action and reaction, the, that center distance changes. And what happens if we look, uh, I guess most people will be familiar with this uh, arbor, this, this mobile. So it comprises a brass wheel, a steel pinion, which is driven by the barrel, as we've just seen, an arbor, and a reduced di diameter of the arbor, which is called a pivot. And we know that that pivot, uh, have I done this? I've made up a little model here, look. That pivot runs in a pivot hole like this, so it rotates. We're all reasonably familiar with that, I guess. Now, if we have a close look at that, so here's our, we're looking down at the end, so we're now looking like this at the end of the arbor. Here's our pivot. Here's the hole in which it runs, which of course has got to be slightly larger diameter. And let's just draw on here for sake of uh, something, our um, oil sink. So it's pencil time. This is just an excuse to get the pencils out, of course. Um, So here's our pivot and here's our uh, kind of brass plate with an oil sink there. And there's oil in here between these two components is lubricating oil. So let's say uh, the pivot is being pushed in this direction. So what happens over time is the brass and the steel, but the brass primarily wears away like this um, and that changes the distance between those two mobiles. Okay, so this hole that started out life, started out life as a circle, he says, eventually wears into something that looks like that. It becomes elongated. And if you look at more and more old clocks, many of you will be totally familiar with this. Um, the, uh, the pivot holes wear. Now, my problem with this is that I see a lot of people on the forum um, looking at that wear and going, that clock needs bushing. And my response to that is it may do uh, if it's stopping or something, but there are a couple of factors and this does get people a bit hot under the collar. So I apologize in advance. One, we don't know that the clock maker put the wheels in the right place when it was new. Maybe on mass product, mass produced clocks like this Smith's Enfield, it's likely that they did. But the other thing is because the wheels and the pinions were, 
we don't know that just because the hole is elongated, um, that putting the wheel back where we think it was originally is the best thing to do. It might be, um, but it also might not. And that's why depthing is critically important in my view as a precursor to putting in bushing. I would say there's far too much bushing done that was probably frankly unnecessary. And I think it's a bit of a rite of passage uh, if I dare say that, because it's a really kind of cool thing to do. It's quite interventive. If you've got a lathe, you can use a lathe and, and so on. But in my practice, and John, if he's out there, hi, John, uh, you know, we discuss this a lot and we do actually surprisingly very little in the way of bushing. There are plenty of clocks out there to be repaired. So there's no shortage of work for everybody. So we don't have to go looking for work, I would say. I think that uh, what I would ask you to do, and anybody who watches this video, is to consider depthing before you jump in there with your bushing. So what is depthing? So let's just go back to our um, original wheels. I'm gonna draw it a bit bigger this time. So uh, this is our big brass wheel and this is our steel pinion. Now, when they, ooh, we've got somebody else waiting to come in there. Okay. When those uh, wheels were designed, the wheels were designed with something called, uh, we'll just call it PCD, which is pitch, circle, diameter. And I'm a little bit stuck here because for many of you, you'll know all this stuff. And for others who are new, this might seem a bit advanced. So I'm trying to kind of balance the two things. Anyway, if you imagine those two wheels as discs of material with no teeth on them at all, just plain smooth discs rubbing together, that theoretical diameter called the pitch circle diameter is the working diameter of that mobile. Now, of course, if you had two smooth discs rubbing together, they would slip. So what we do to make them grip together or run together is we add a tooth without much gap there um, uh, to the outside of the pitch circle diameter. And this added on bit is easy to remember because it's called the addendum. Now, obviously when this, if this tooth is going in this direction, when it comes around to the pinion, it's gonna jam. So what you have to do is to cut a slot in here to accept the tooth. And you have to also cut slots between the teeth to accept the sticking out bit, the addendum of the pinion as well. And this bit, the cut away bit, is called the dead end, ooh, dead end dump. So we've got a bit added on and we've got a bit cut away, the addendum and the dedendum. Uh, you yeah, were going to get onto clock depth and tools in a in a bit. Um, thank you for reminding me though. Uh, so these two pitch circle diameters, if you remember back to our last little sketchy drawing, as they change, particularly where they move apart. So this theoretical circle is no longer touching this theoretical circle. And when that happens, now typically it's not always that they move apart. Sometimes they move together depending on the um, relationship of the wheels. But what happens is the incoming pinion leaf, <laughs> the one that's coming into the cycle of engagement, actually butts up against a wheel tooth. And this is called engaging friction, which sucks energy out of the system and eventually the clock stops. So obviously what we want to do is we want to return those two mobiles to their best pitch circle diameter. And we do that with a process called bushing. Great. Uh, we'll talk about bushing after our second little break. But so you're asking the question, you're saying, okay, Matthew, I've got a clock, it doesn't work. I think it might need bushing. How on earth do I find out whether it, it, the depth thing is right? It's okay, it could be improved or it's hopeless and I have to start again. So here's how you do it. Uh, we'll get onto the depthing tool in a while. But first, let's just look, because the depthing tools can be quite expensive. Let's just put our couple of wheels in the frame and let's go back to there. 
put a couple of wheels in the frame, skills fingers. Normally I'd wear gloves when handling clocks, but um, it's just too awkward here. So what you do, let's imagine that this pivot here, uh, which way is it going? It's going, I'll get this right. Yeah, it's going that way. So basically uh, this barrel is pushing it uh, somewhere in this direction. Um, let's say this pivot is elongated and we think this might be causing the clock to stop. Now it's ever so easy at this stage to jump in and to start working on this bearing hole and putting a new bush in there without doing the depth thing. Do the depth thing first. And I'm looking, oh, there's my bit of pegwood. And it's dead easy to find out whether the depth the bushing needs doing because what you do first, and I've seen people, and this is, um, I apologize if you're one of the people that does this, I, uh, it just drives me crazy. But anyway, <laughs> spinning the wheels like that and saying it's fine. It's not spinning the wheels. I'm afraid it makes you feel good, uh, but it's pretty meaningless. Sorry, I have to say that, get it off my chest. Uh, anybody who's out there has been one of my students uh, will remember me saying that before. So let's just uh, put a nut on here to prevent it falling apart the whole time. There we go. So we know that when the clock runs, the mobiles have been pushed apart from one another. So what we do first is we put on a bit of resistance on the arbor and excuse my, stand up, excuse my fingers here. Put a bit of resistance on the arbor and we push the wheels together and turn them in the direction that they would normally run. So, yeah, that's the direction they would normally run. And we detect how smooth that engagement is. Uh, it takes a bit of practice. Then what we do is we, you can't really see because my fingers in the way, but push them apart and do exactly the same operation. Now, this is one of those classic examples where you have to believe me, but have a go yourself. They're actually smoother when they're pushed apart than when they are, when they're together. Really difficult to see on the camera. I apologize for that, but it's worth getting a frame with two mobiles in and doing this exercise. So push them together under load, push them apart under load. Now, like this, they're fractionally smoother when they're apart tells me that if this clock is stopping, it's not because that bearing needs bushing. Now, actually this bearing isn't particularly warm, so that's not a surprise. But my advice to you, if I may, is if you've got a clock that you think needs bushing, go through this process, put all the mobiles in, in pairs, and check them under load, pushed apart and pushed together. And if they are, significantly or noticeably smoother when they're together, then yes, you've got a depthing issue. The, the wheels are not running at their optimum depthing. But frankly, like this, they're often smooth, perfectly fine as they are all happy, smooth when they're apart. You don't need to do bushing. In fact, what we see time and time and time again is that people doing bushing because the pivots wobbling about in the hole quite a bit, and it causes more problems because it causes uprighting problems and burrs and all that kind of uh, stuff like that. So in the, just before we go for our second little mini break, um, let's just say this clock is in fact like our, I've lost it now, our clock we were looking at before. Um, all right, got another one here. Let's say this clock is like this, and please somebody in the live chat say, what do you think about these punched up holes, Matthew? Um, <laughs> the, um, let's say you've got this clock and you can see it's a 19th century clock, 18th century clock, it was anyway, it's been, it's long ago not been a clock, um, but you can't really kind of trust these centers. So doing that operation I've just described doesn't really work, so what do you do? Well, the answer is, if you can afford it, you buy a depthing tool. And I'll very quickly show you the depthing tool, which is this device. And uh, what you do here, I'll slightly, 
badly organized. So let's just, you can see that the depthing tool is basically, it's a bit like a massive brass door hinge. These two pieces of material are separate. They're hinged in the middle and you can adjust the distance here between these runners by adjusting this screw. Um, let's just find... Uh, now, you can see straight away that the problem with putting this barrel in is that these runners are not suitable for holding the barrel. So I'm going to change them for these runners. It's all, all this stuff's going to be in our book. are called trumpet runners and hopefully they fit in. Yeah, there we go. Like that and like that. So we've got one of our mobiles in there and the other one goes in here. Like that. like that. So as you can see, now what we can do is we can look at the depth thing totally independent of the clock's own frame. We've we got more questions there. Yeah. How much does depth tool cost? Um, how much does depth tool cost? Really good uh, answer. Um, these ones uh, were made by somebody, I don't know if he's still in business, called JMW Clocks. He's in Sheffield in England. And they're quite a lot of money, I think, at the last call they were hundreds and hundreds of pounds but there are quite a lot of youtube videos about making your own online and i think there are some versions i'm sorry i don't actually know the answer to that question but i imagine they're gonna set you back two three hundred pounds uh for a commercially made one but you probably know better than i do uh, how much they cost but unfortunately they're one of those essential tools that you can't really live without uh once you get into the kind of the next stages of clock making which is why we left them out of our first book. So we don't want people to be intimidated by... Oh, repair punch more questions. Oh yeah. So we might not get around to it this week, but somebody's asked, and thank you for taking the hint, to uh, about the punched up bushings. Um, I once had somebody at a lecture pushing me in the chest, going very red in the face about those things. Uh, not that I do them, uh, he hastens to add, but uh, how I deal with them. So you can see the beauty of the depthing tool is that it allows you an infinite adjustment of the meshing of those mobiles. Let's just move it down there. So the barrel is going, this wheel's going anti-clockwise. Uh, and it's important to get the direction of rotation correct because as the wheels wear, they tend to wear better in one direction than the other. So we can adjust the distance until they mesh. And then again, don't spin the wheels, it's pointless. Put some load on the driven mobile. And I don't know if you can hear, if I stop talking for a minute, it's really rough because they're too close together. So we fractionally open up the center distance. No, they were too far apart, sorry. And we do this two or three times until we get the very smoothest mesh we can. And once we've done that, we know that this is the kind of ideal theoretical center distance for our two wheels. Now, you might be saying, well, I could have already bushed a clock by now, Matthew, because you're banging on and this is all unnecessary. Um, but I think not. I think actually once you get used to the first method I showed you, if you're not already doing that of just um, using the clock's own frame for depthing, you actually very rarely need uh, to use a depthing tool. So now, if we put those runners back in, and we go back to our clock frame without scratching it, got the wrong one in there. We'll go back to our clock frame, let's put that one in. We know that the distance between these tips of the uh, depthing tool is what we feel is the optimum depthing for that pair of mobiles. And we can check that with our frame by putting that in there. And, oh, 
must be quarter two. And without scratching the frame, you can just about see, let's just move this one to video. You can just about see how we would check the depth thing. Now, if the depth thing was miles off, what we might decide to do is to actually pl plug one of these holes with brass. You know, if you've got a really difficult problem and use these describing marks on the end of the depth thing to the, the uh, runners to mark the new position of the hole, drill a new hole and go there. And hopefully you can see how that is kind of more um, diagnostic than looking at the pivot shaking in the hole. That's just an indication that the hole might need depth, might need bushing, but you actually need, in my view, to go through this depthing process first. And I think if you do, what you'll find is that you do actually relatively little bushing, which is great for the clock, it's great for you, saves time, it's great for the customer because you don't have to charge them as much and so on and so forth. So we'll have another two minute break. Uh, we'll come back at about uh, 48 and we'll talk very briefly about pushing and we'll draw the uh, the price for the Tam O'Shanter stone. So see you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Um, so just a quick reminder, if you haven't already, get your name in the hat for the prize, this week's prize, which is the Tam O Shanta horn. Quite a rare thing nowadays, reasonably difficult to get. So we're gonna draw that in a few minutes. We'll just round up this. What I'll do for next week, if anybody's interested, is I'll draw out what I think uh, this clock would have looked like or the train with the fusy stop irons and all that kind of stuff. Because I think getting these old plates, thanks for it, uh, and doing some diagnosis is really useful. I'm pretty sure that what this is here, and this little cutout is the clue, um, is pull quarter repeating. A lot of English or European spring clocks from the 17th and early 18th century had the two trains. So they normally strike the hours just like normal. But then there's a string coming out of the side, very different from trip repeating. You pull on the string and it would tell you the hour, uh, usually with a peal of bells and then some dinging, a dinging on the hour uh, to the closest quarter of an hour. Different from trip repeating. I'm pretty sure this is pull quarter repeating that you see up here. Um, so it's like a third train, whoever uh, said that. But yeah, next week, it'd be a good exercise for me is to map out in drawing what this would have looked like when it was new. That would be quite cool. Okay, so we've decided with our bushing exercise that let's say, for instance, theoretically, this pivot here um, has worn and that center distance uh, is larger than it should be. And we want to move that pivot back to its original position. And what we do, th what we do is we open the hole and insert a new sleeve of brass, in this case, material, 
which is called a bush. So we'll just talk about that opening up of the hole first. Um, and we're going to obviously, on our, my um, screen has disappeared somehow. Where's it gone? Right, okay. Let's get this protecting tool. So um, here's our oil sink. Here's our original pivot. It's worn in this direction, so it looks something like that. So the pivot jumps about in the hole when we waggle it. Now, let's say that the manufacturer, this is a modern clock, so let's say the manufacturer's original center distance was correct. We've checked it by depthing tool, or we've squished the two arbors together, and we're happy with this position here. So how do we get our arbor back to that position? Well, the way I would do it would be to get um, a very fine file, which again, got so many tools on the go here now. Uh, and I would file the hole across in the opposite direction to where, like this. Then once we've done that, what I would do is then open this hole. And this is where we get to the difference between hand broaching and machine, uh, hand bushing, sorry, and machine bushing. I would open that hole up. And because we've filed across the hole by the same amount that it's worn on the other side, then in theory, at least, when we open this hole with a reamer, a brooch or a reamer, I'll show you what those are in a minute, then the hole returns to its new or earlier centre distance, which is what we're trying to achieve here. We're not trying to get it back where it was originally because we don't know that that ever was right or that the wheels and pinions haven't worn. What we're trying to get it back to or move it forward to, which is more accurately, is a new centre where the wheels run smoothly. Once we've done that by filing the hole across, and I'm just sketching around for my file, um, we can open up the hole we put in, let's just move on. So we've opened our hole here. Here's the original oil sink size. And we know that our pivot is gonna fit in there. So we have to insert a sleeve of brass here that's going to fill that space. And how we open up that hole is really the only difference between hand and machine bushing. So if I just show you, this device. Um, so this will be very familiar to some of you and not at all familiar to others. This is a clockmaker's brooch and it's five-sided. So if you look along the end, it's pentagonal in section and it's hardened and tempered steel. And in order to open the hole, let's just find one that's the right size. Let's say we were pushing this hole here. You basically rotate the brooch um, in the hole, and that actually cuts away at the side of the hole and enlarges it. So we, we would use clockmaker's brooch. Personally, I think for the beginner, this is the way to go because with this, you can see that you've got an infinite number of sizes between this point and this point. And brooches come in sets, so you get a whole range of sizes. This allows you a massive amount of control. Um, the other way of doing it, so this is called hand bushing because you open up the hole by hand with a clock maker's brooch. The other way of doing it is to use a machine um, into which fits these little reamers. And if you look at this cutter, which is called a reamer in section, you can see there very easily, but it's kind of D section. So when you buy a bushing system or bushing tool, it comes with a whole range of devices for uh, opening up the sizes. See, we've got big ones and smaller ones and stuff like that. And for cutting and chamfering and so on. So these fit 
into a frame, uh, a, a bushing tool frame, which we can, if there's any interest, very happy to come back to it in subsequent weeks. But what happens there is you open up the hole, uh, basically exactly the same. The single difference is that with the brooch, you end up with a tapered hole and with the machine or bushing system, you end up with a parallel hole. There is basically no difference. You're doing the same process in changing the center, drawing it across with a file in this case, and then putting in a sleeve of brass. So in the last few minutes, let's just have a look at what those bushes, uh, ooh, we've got another person there. Sorry if you've been there a long time. Um, let's have a look what those bushes look like. Uh, and there are two main ways that you would approach this. One is to use bushing wire, uh, and I'm pretty low on stock at the moment, which is a bit of a shame. But what bushing wire is, is um, sticks of hard drawn brass. And irrespective of whether you use a bushing system or machine bushing, or you use hand bushing, as I tend to do, it's really, what's really important is the quality of the material of the bush that you put in the hole. There's no point in rebushing a clock and going to all that work and putting some uh, brass in there that isn't a good bearing surface. So the material should be hardened. Brass work hardens by, uh, in this case, by drawing. So this is hard drawn wire. Um, and you could, obviously this is a long piece of material that you have to chop off bits either with a saw or in a lathe or something like that. Again, I can demonstrate. Um, if you use the machine bushing system, you, uh, they, you buy these things in little packets. I've got this posh set, which I've had for a long, long, long time. Um, what you'll find is that the bushes are pre-made. So they're basically a very similar material. It's absolutely critical that they're a hard brass. And that's why personally, I would say don't use some random unspecified brand of bushes. Buy from either, there are two brands of machine bushing. One's called Bergeon, which is a Swiss made, and one's called KWM, I think, which I think is German, it might be Swiss now, I don't know. Um, but they're good quality, hard bushes. And you can see the beauty of this is, you've got a lot, lot less machining to do um, because it's already kind of cut to size. However, there's a lot more to say on using these bushes um, as they are. Now we're gonna run out of time. So what I would say in the live chat or during the week on our uh, YouTube video or on social media, Twitter, you name it. If you wanna see more of this stuff and to expand one of these conversations, then let us know and we'll do a demonstration of hand bushing, machine bushing, or in fact, uh, both if we've got the, the patience. So we're coming towards the end. So we've got our tin here and uh, in best um, Yorkshire style, it's if anybody from England or been to England, they'll know the famous Betty's Tea Room. So we're doing this in actual Yorkshire style and we've got their names in there. So the winner of the Tam O'Shanter Stone is Paul Mitchell, yay. So Paul, if you get in touch with us, and uh, DM us or something and send us your uh, snail mail address, we will put that Tamo Shanta stone in the, uh, in the post on Monday morning. So again, as always in these sessions, massive thank you to you for keeping the live chat going. What we do is we print that off and then we look through it and we think about how we're going to deal with next week. Thank you especially new beginner clocks people. Again, quite a technical sort of intensive uh, week this week. Um, hope you stick with us. Thank you to those people who've joined us for the first time. And we will be here with a picture of that clock plate, hopefully with some drawings on it, uh, if anybody's interested. And more on bushing if you want, or we can move on to something completely new. You let us know. Thanks again. Thanks for the team uh, here. And uh, I say Happy New Year and see you next week. Thank you. Bye.